there are a few other variations that might be more effective and we'll look at that also um, again. But the other technique is called cartogram um, and in this technique we tend to skew the map um, and take something that is familiar and make it slightly unfamiliar uh, and then try to visually sort of represent data, right? So this is a map of the world with where every country is sized according to its population, right? And you can now clearly see India, China, you know, really big, European nations become smaller, um, America is okay, Mexico stands out a bit more, and you know, some of the other sort of countries are becoming tinier and tinier, right? Uh, and you could probably do this with an interactive piece. So this piece was um, for a world mapper, right? And it changes as you choose things like wealth, uh, carbon sort of uh, resource extraction, emission, uh, historical emission, which is you know, Europe and North America being fairly like these and reserves, Middle East having like high amount of reserve or poverty where you can see like a huge sort of scale, right? And so this is interesting because this sort of skews what is familiar into something that maybe looks unfamiliar. It isn't very accurate, which is okay. That isn't really the goal of it, but it gives you some new perspectives about how to look at the world as well. But you don't always have to skew and make these very weird looking shapes. You can also take something abstract or simple shape to uh, represent each part. So in this case, every circle is one state of America. It's loosely positioned close to its original location. The size of it represents population. And the color is changing from like blue, yellow to red, which is talking about obesity, right? And as you see, uh, from 1980s till 2008, uh, the average sort of uh, obesity rate um, in America has just skyrocketed, right? And turns from uh, low amount of people, about 14% um, percent of people having obesity to all the way up to like 30% and higher. Uh, being in the obese category, right? And this has been a common conversation for um, US about just the kind of food that they're eating, processed food, lifestyle changes leading to a lot of this. Uh, but this is a form of cartogram, right? We are taking something familiar, geographically accurate, skewing things around it based on data to make something new. And this specific technique is called the Dorling cartogram. Right? You can try a few other cartograms. So instead of a circle, you could make squares, right? And this is again, a cartogram with squares, each square is a state and it you know tries to change the size based on a particular data point. You could see this effectively used for uh, Indian elections, right? And this is a map that was done by Venkert's uh, lab. So some of the students worked on general elections and 2019 on the left shows the accurate sort of geographical map where the constituencies are in the geographically accurate shapes. The one on the right shows every constituency as a hexagon, right? And it tries to pack it as close to possible. And you can start to see some gaps because some areas have larger, some constituency of larger areas, but they still count as like one constituency. So they end up becoming a smaller hexagon over here. Whereas in some cases, a small set of like, uh, a smaller areas of constituencies are all individual constituencies, like heavily packed dense areas. So those sort of expand and need more area, like in the bottom that you can see, with Tamil Nadu, Kerala, they have a lot more constituencies, even though they are smaller, heavy population. So they tend to like expand into the blue sort of blob that you see in the bottom, right? Um, for India, at least, because India split so sort of, uh, I don't know, heavily, you don't see like a really stark difference, although you still can start to notice that the map on the left feels a lot more orange um, than it really is if you see it on the right, right? So. Uh, a lot more parties, there, a lot more constituencies there voted for uh, NDA, which is represented in orange, right? Uh, and those constituencies might be larger in size, so they feel a lot more orange than it actually is um, that you see over here on the right. Uh, and parts of Tamil Nadu and Kerala, which have higher number of constituencies, get neglected in an accurate geographical map, but are probably m better represented in the second map because every constituency has like a equal say uh, of sorts, right, in the elections per se. Uh, and then there are a few other techniques. So for US at least, I've seen a lot of people do this, which uh, is a better approach instead of making a car, uh, make, making a choropleth, which is to make a square or a hexagon for every state and then color it. So instead of giving an area, um, they color equally and make these tiled sort of grid maps. And these are also another variation of um, choropleths. Um, so they're using choropleth-like approach, but they're not sticking to the geographical area. 
right? So they're sort of skewing things around or simplifying things. So here is the same map that we saw as an animation, obesity in America. But now this has been sort of put as this technique called small multiples, which is repeating the same chart again and again, but changing one element of data in it. Right? And so you can see this pixel-like approach. Every square is one state. And you can see from like 1985 all the way till 2015, the color scale goes from 10% uh, being dark green to above 30% being dark purple. And you can see how over the last two decades, um, you know, obesity rates have really increased in America. So, all right. So that I think wraps up the major part of the the lecture that I had, right? And uh, these are probably the most common techniques that you will use: dots, choroplets, um, bins, and cartograms, right? Uh, cartograms, at least the first set that I showed, the one that skew a lot, are fairly hard to create, especially if you're doing them dynamically. But the the latter ones, the one that were equal shapes, you know, making a square, making a hexagon, those are fairly easy to make uh, and become like a pretty popular and common sort of newsroom approach as well. A lot of newsrooms then make one nice cartogram uh, or like a tiled sort of grid map of America or of India. And then they just have to change colors every time to make it work. Right? So that's certainly a very effective technique. Uh, the last three are heat maps, isoplets, and flow maps. I'll quickly show like one or two examples of these. So heat maps are pretty much what you would have seen in movies, et cetera. Right? They're literally like this. They have this rainbow color palette. Uh, like Snapchat, yes, uh, and what this shows is uh, where there are a lot of photos being taken on a Snapchat map, right? Uh, so how many people are uploading snaps which are public from where? And the places where there's a really dark red, you can see like a lot of photos being uploaded from, right? So uh, like this is, I think, Mecca. Um, and so there is a lot of like photography around this area, which is like a religious place. So a lot of people going there for pilgrimage. Uh, and you can see it stand out on that map um, on, on the left as well, right? Um, it works fairly well for a high-level overview. Colors sometimes become dicey when you look at a heat map, uh, and a lot of time it can get confusing as to what each color represents. Um, and there's a lot of critique of the rainbow color palette. Um, for those who are interested, you can look up a few other color palettes that are alternate. Like there is Viridis and a bunch of other sort of interesting, uh, scientifically like more accurate color palette, which have a gradual ramp instead of something like this where, well, even in this case, we used um, like a gradual color ramp when you were building this for Snapchat. Um, but in some cases, you will see that the green is also very dark, the blue is also very dark, and so it becomes very hard to notice which is high, which is low. Uh, and some of the weather maps that you will see might follow some of those very old um, rainbow, rainbow color palettes, right? So that's maybe something to think about. Uh, the next are isoplets fairly novel and slightly complex. Huh? They use lines or regions to mark uh, discrete steps in data. So we'll see an example here. This is a map that I made of uh, all the places in Bangalore and how far they are, but not in terms of distance, in terms of time, what Penkert was talking about yesterday. right? So you can see this is where I am. And from here, I can see like an isochrone, um, a map based on time, which is this is the region till 10 minutes. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, right? And it's basically doing multiple queries using some sort of a navigation API, uh, checking how much time it would take for me to get here, 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 making a boundary, and then giving me these discrete boundaries out of it, right? So this becomes an example of isoplet. You would see a lot of this for um, atmospheric data, like bar, uh, atmospheric pressure or rainfall. This area will have a lot of rainfall or even temperature. Or if you've seen contour maps of mountains, they'll have elevation made uh, with something like this. Right? So these are all like familiar ways. You can also use them to bucket things. Like in this case, this is a Mint article around um, Delhi. And they were basically evaluating if the metro really connects all the populated parts of Delhi or are some parts left out. Right? So there is a metro map, which is the black lines. Um, then they've taken this area around the metro. So if you look. Um, over here, you can see these gray sort of lines around each metro stop, right? Like the, this yellowish sort of area, right? So they've taken this much as a this area around the metro stop and then highlighted how there are a bunch of these areas here, um, areas here, which are all very dense in population, but don't have a metro that is more than a kilometer. Like they have a metro that is more than a kilometer away. So metro isn't very equally reaching out to the densest part of Delhi. 
Yeah, so this becomes isoplet. It's very dynamic. Um, wherever you are, it will change. Um, it is very novel. Not many people see this. Um, it also becomes interesting to play around with. Uh, next is flow maps. These are also, uh, these are the simpler set of maps. Uh, they're really useful if you're telling a story, if you're talking about things happening from one part to another, movement, etc. So you can see examples of this, which is like a digital map of uh, slave trade from Africa. So it really highlights all the ports from which slaves were taken from Africa. And then, you know, all the different parts they went to. So North America, Mexico, the South Latin America region, uh, South America region as well, right? And so the arrow's thickness is being used as magnitude to visualize. And then the end and the start point are basically geographically representing the place where it started and ended from. Right? And you can see a bunch of variation, like this is migration to Delhi, from major metros um, and which places have had less change in like lesser migrants coming in or higher migrants coming in from different parts of the country, right? And so Min did this very interesting article of migration across cities and they uh, made this map for a bunch of different sort of um, uh, major metros and seeing where people are coming in from, are they increasing, are they reducing? You can see a similar map of uh, America which you can barely see because of the contrast. Uh, and this talks about where do people go to study in, uh, from one state to another state, right? And this really is talking about like how public university are not enough in America and they're not able to satisfy the demands of every state. So for some states like California, most of the people from California actually end up like going to neighboring states to also study in public universities because there aren't enough spaces in, in there. And you can see something similar happening in Illinois, and in Minnesota, and some of the other sort of universities as well. Yeah. So this flow map is fairly simple. It talks a lot more about stories, about things connecting one place to another, um, and has some very minimal amount of data, maybe for thickness of the arrow, et cetera, to be used as well. And the last is the sort of infamous 3D visualization. And I show you two examples that I think it works well. Uh, but often 3D gets misused. So this is an example of a zoning map for Vancouver that we had done. Um, and in this case, uh, you see Vancouver is a fairly like organized city, uh, very thought through in terms of building it. And so the downtown area over there is the one that has a bunch of buildings. So you can see some of the high rise buildings there, whereas everything else is residential and therefore has a limit on the height of the building. And most of these buildings are like one floor or two floors only, right? Unlike Bombay, for example. So um, you can see a 3D layer makes it even more evident that that top area is the sort of industrial area, the hub, uh, and everywhere else we just have like really small residential complexes being built, right? And then they use color to highlight specific property uh, or like specific land use types as well. Um, here is another one which you were doing for San Francisco, which was the sort of density map in each block, right? And we tilt it to then sort of extrude and build like a 3D nest in it, right? And I still find this slightly gimmicky because it's not like it tells you anything new but uh, it can exaggerate those specific like light green, light blue spots that were earlier just tiny to something that is really exact. So if you wanted to really highlight a point that, uh, oh, this really has a lot of X amount of data, uh, just coloring it there in those cells may not be enough. And so 3D really sort of exaggerates or uh, emphasizes on your point a lot. Um, and a lot of time it catches your eye. So a bit gimmicky, but sometimes useful if your audience isn't very interested and may fall asleep sort of looking at it. So instead give them a 3D and people go ooh, ah, into it, which is one of the reasons why I made a 3D sort of map for the Washington DC uh, map because it was presented at a conference of Smart City. Uh, and we were making a case for why they need a lot more tools like this, right? And they're like boring public officials seeing one talk after another of like PowerPoint with bullets. So we thought, okay, this might at least wake them up a bit and you know get them slightly excited about the possibility. So a bit of 3Dness is not very, um, useful. So in this case, for example, because there's a big bar, it hides some of the elements behind it because of the nature of 3D, right? So 3D has its own limitations. Uh, there's also perspective being added onto this map, which you may or may not notice, but things that are closer to me will look bigger. Things that are farther away will look smaller, which on a flat visualization, it wouldn't be the case, right? So there are all of these limitations of a map where uh, 3D maps so, sort of exaggerate some, sort of diminish some, hide some or obscure some, but uh, they also catch attention. So depending on your goals, you may choose one over another, right? So uh, when you're picking 3D, which is why it's last on the list, 
you really want to see if the new dimension is adding value or adding confusion or something of that sort. Yeah, so that was um, yeah one and a half hours of long me speaking. We'll take a break in five minutes. I'll just run through some bits right now, and then we can take a break. So um, I wanted to just give you one slide of tools, right? So uh, these are the common tools that people use when they're trying to visualize data on a map. Um, they're basically broken into three categories. So interactive tools are those for which you don't need code. Um, you don't need to know programming. Uh, Tableau, the one that I showed for the war and GTP migration visualization is something in Tableau, very easy to use. Flourish, uh, actually I might have examples of these later. And then Mapbox Studio, another one which is very easy uh, to visualize data on. Whereas a bunch of programming platforms like D3, Mapbox GLJS, DeckGL, uh, which is by Uber, um, ggmap and basemap, you know, a bunch of other ones are also effective if you're writing code and want to visualize, right? And then there's GIS tools, um, much more, uh, I think traditional tools uh, used a lot in newsrooms, in government, public policy, architecture. And ArcGIS is the corporate sort of SRE based um, GIS tool and QGIS is the open source sort of version as well. Um, so you can have a look at them. I think Graminer also had this set of coroplets that you can make in Excel. Um, this is what Flourish looks like. So it gives you all of these ready-made templates that you can just plug and play data in and you get to make like these nice stories and timelines, et cetera, with it. Uh, Tableau has a bunch of things where you can just drop a geolocate, like geolocated uh, data set and it'll put it on a map, like this one which I had done, which was uh, accidents uh, in, um, UK and like road rage and some of that visualization. Um, and it also has story points. So on the top you see these tabs get made. So you can actually categorize things and make like a narrative around it in Tableau if you haven't tried that. And this is what QGIS looks like. So it's slightly old looking uh, because it is old. It's open source uh, and it's really powerful. So for a lot of um, detailed data, geo data, I think QGIS works really well, which even the new tools in browser don't work as effectively, right? And then this is Mapbox. You can make all the fun stuff that I was showing. Um, yeah, and then one slide, which I think best to ask Venkar because he would have like more resources, but these are like common places to look for Indian data. Uh, there is this community called Data Meet, which has um, a very active Google, ma uh, Google group, uh, which is like a mailing list. They also have a GitHub repo where they put data sets like shape files of uh, Indian sort of states, constituencies, et cetera. There are obviously India's like data portals, data.gov and India data portal. Um, there's OpenStreetMap, um, and then the, you can always ask on the Google group and see if you can find some sort of information there. Oh yeah, and uh, I like to end with this sort of amusing quote by a sort of journalist in NPR, which is nothing in certain in this life but death, taxes, and then request to put geographical data on a map. So clearly like in journalist world, this is as, as uh, intense for them to get, right? So. Yeah, that is all. That's all the lectures that we have for today. Um, 